it's pretty easy to hide on Zoom. Whereas you, when you're spending five, six hours going for lunch, hanging out with someone, and you actually get to have those moments where you're just speaking, not related to their company. It doesn't feel like due diligence. It's just really getting to know them as people. Blockchain is a fast moving industry. The exit opportunity here is much faster than the traditional industry where you have to wait for like five to eight years before you gain any sort of potential liquidity. With tokens, you could easily gain those within half a year. AI faces you know, major, major challenges with alignment. I think this is like an area that I encourage the AI alignment crowd and the open source crowd and the AI safety crowd just to start experimenting a bit more. Hey everyone, I'm excited to bring you another insightful episode of New Forum. New Forum is a community inviting purpose-driven visionaries, creators, developers, and investors to spark accessible conversations on the topics of crypto, the metaverse, NFTs, and everything Web3. And today we have not one, but three wonderful guest speakers with us. We are going to discuss uh, everything around Web3 subject with Jamie Wallace from Bitcraft Fund, Sean Yu from Backed VC, and Avi Zarla from Delphi Digital. So I would like to thank you guys for joining us today. Really thrilled to see you. Uh, let's start with the round of introductions. Maybe just introduce yourself and your fund. Uh, yeah, go for it. Jamie, do you want to go first? Sure, yeah, happy to. Thanks for having uh, me on today. Hey everyone, I'm Jamie. Um, started background studying finance, fell down the crypto rabbit hole, started a research company with a friend in the space. Um, used that as sort of an outlet to meet a bunch of people in the space, sort of got into DeFi, NFT gaming, started an Axie guild, and from there stumbled upon Bitcraft uh, when they raised their $75 million token fund, reached out, uh, and have been with them for about a year and a half now as one of the first hires first junior hires on that token fund. Bitcraft Ventures were a fully dedicated gaming and interactive entertainment venture fund founded in 2016. Now we manage about $930 million of capital across five funds, two funds being fully focused on in the intersection of blockchain and gaming. So we raised one $75 million fund, um, which we've been deploying for about 24 months now. Um, and we just in the process of closing out our second fund. So about 45 companies um, in our portfolio, sort of at the intersection of blockchain and gaming. Um, yeah. Great. Avi, do you want to go? Yeah. Thanks for having me on. Um, I'm Avi. I'm an investor at Delphi Digital. I've been with the firm for two years. Prior to that, I spent some time in software development, a bit of time in finance and startups. Delphi Digital is a research first crypto firm. Uh, we build protocols, we write research, and uh, we invest in early stage startups and networks. Great. Thank you. Sean? Cool. I guess it's me. Uh, thank you for having me on, Marina. I'm Sean from BackVC. Prior to joining Back, I was at a firm called Target Global, which is a growth equity fund. And prior to that, I studied bioengineering at Imperial College London. Uh, while I was at university, I founded Imperial College London's Blockchain Society and served as the president all the way until I graduated. At the same time, I've also done quite a few different things in the crypto world. I started my own hedge fund, uh, raised about 10 million for the first fund called Cousins & Co, uh, based in China and run it all the way into 2021 October. Then I started to learn more about DeFi and kind of jumped into the rabbit hole there. So as well as gaming, because I used to play games competitively in Australia. Currently at back, I, I lead the Web3 investments and research. Uh, there's a focus on things such as gaming and zero knowledge. Uh, as for Backed, Backed is a 200 million generalist fund focused on pre-seed and seed. Uh, and we are in the process of closing out our fourth vehicle third fund uh, with a focus on crypto uh, as well. That's super exciting. Thank you, Sean, for jumping to my next question already about your personal journey of how you started to, to invest and uh, how you became... Uh, a venture capital as associate now in in backed. Uh, so it would be great also to know from you uh, guys, Jamie and Avi, your personal journeys too. And uh, you know how it's it's interesting to actually like know how people become investors. And for anyone out there who who is looking into this uh, path in their career, I guess it would be useful. 
Jamie, you want to go first? Yeah, sure. Um, I guess I've always had a bit of a finance bug. I've always been interested uh, in investing sort of since a young age. I've been fascinated by the fact that you can make money with your money without having to do anything. I also think it's just generally cool to be able to take bets on certain theses, et cetera, and be able to profit off of those going to according to plan. So for me, always been into finance, always been looking for ways to invest. Um, actually try to get my parents to like sign off on an investment account for me before I turned uh, the minimum age you could be, but they wouldn't. That's why I sort of discovered crypto in 2016, 2017, because it was one of the only asset classes I could invest in. So for me, like that's what in university went straight into finance, sort of love that stuff, always wanted to be on the investment side. Uh, and part of the reason why I ended up choosing to go work at a venture capital firm versus potentially more on an operator side or sort of for a, a company. Yeah, like I just I just wanted to quickly touch upon that you also have been a athlete as well. Like you have a quite strong background in sports, right? Yeah, I did. I did play sports sort of um, throughout high school, university. Thankfully, I was able to to balance and merge sort of finance, my studies, uh, the crypto stuff with with sports as well. But had a I guess pretty successful sporting career. Played in a few big tournaments worldwide. That's fascinating. Uh, it's interesting how do you jump from one big career to another, which is completely different things, actually, sports and, and investing. Avi, uh, I want to know about you as well. Let, uh, let us know, how did you become an investor? It's super exciting. My path was um, a, bit, a bit less intentional, a, l- a little bit more wandering, a little bit more lost. Uh, I, I graduated school and I wasn't quite sure what I wanted to do. And I had to code a bit, so I picked up a, a consulting job at a, a software consultant and was writing full stack code. And during my working hours, I was spending most of my time on Twitter and messing around with um, smart contracts and trying to understand what was going on through DeFi summer. And so this is sort of the, the time period where I'd really sort of on a day-to-day basis dedicating time to researching crypto. And it was just sort of serendipitously that I was on Twitter and Anil, one of the Delphi digital co-founders, had tweeted out that they were looking to hire some interns. And I figured it was about time to to take my, you know, nights and weekends hobby that was creeping into my working hours into like a real career. And so I worked uh, part-time for Delphi Digital as an intern. And two, two and a half months later, they offered me a full-time role. And I chose to to join the ventures team primarily because I thought it would be a great sort of marriage between some of my technical background and and really deep curiosities and and hopefully getting to talk to real people and and brilliant founders and and that's exactly what it's been so it's been 2 years of like really fulfilling work and you know feel confident that I I have a long career ahead of me um but yeah it was totally unplanned uh, I definitely you asked me this 3 years ago BC I don't think was it on the list Oh man, that's super interesting. And so, Sean, did you know that you're going to be in, in an innovation always, or what was your driver? I, I think I I took a similar path, kind of to uh, to Avi in terms of like wandering around and doing different things. Like I I never really knew that I was going to be a VC after graduation. To be fair, when I was at university, I wanted to be an engineer first, and I did quite a bit of research with um, UK Dementia Research Center as well. So I, I did multiple things at school and I tried out different sort of hobbies and ended up realizing that I really like to work with entrepreneurs, but also I want to kind of understand the finance side about how to kind of evaluate them and how to help them grow, especially from zero to one. So there's, you know, companies who help you to go, to go from one to a hundred. And then there's the ones who help you to go from zero to one. And I feel like I'm kind of leaning towards the latter, which I could help people to go from basically scratch or just having an idea to something that they could find a product market fit, hopefully. Um, and that's why kind of I wandered into the VC world later. And by far, I'm really enjoying it. And I feel like that, like you said, innovation is quite exciting. And, and that's something I really enjoy by talking to a bunch of aspiring founders here. Yeah, I totally agree. It's super exciting for me as well. So now I I really want to know a little more about how do VCs actually found really great deals to invest Uh, in terms of like the story. I would like to kind of hear how did you meet one of your best startups, I guess, Web3 startups and 
what what made you invest in them like how did the relationship develop like did you invest straight away or did you maybe took your time to kind of think about it and like see how they develop like it would be great to know just one story that you that you find interesting um maybe let's start with Abby this time or sure generally we find uh founders and and startups from a variety of different channels and this can range especially in crypto from you know, scouring twitter and lurking in discords to sort of deal referrals from other investors or portfolio company founders and actually finding the deal um at, at least for me is like the the least exciting part the most you know exciting part is is actually like getting to know the product and technology and then on the flip side getting to know you know the people behind that product and technology and so at Delphi we emphasize um economic sustainability and protocol mechanics for the, the product and technology and that's sort of our research roots showing and then on the founder side i put a really high emphasis on founder empathy and their ability to empathize with the consumer so um and so i'll i'll, I'll spend as much time as possible trying to get an understanding of this very intangible you know quality that a, a characteristic that a founder may have and it's it's really just through as many conversations as you possibly can and and i think you know the best investments they tend to be ones where the diligence process is is long and there's a lot of debate internally as to you know is this a good uh or worthwhile investment is this something that we want to do and I think uh you know those are also I think where 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 the conversations and investing gets easy or gets fun because you're being challenged by you know this this isn't the right perspective I have this perspective and uh yeah that that diligence process is is really where the the sausage is made so to speak good to hear that i mean it would be very interesting if investors would invest without really strong due diligence i mean it's uh, it's a bit of a risky process and the risky business in general you, innovation right so uh, you'd be surprised yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and jamie so i know that you invested in a couple of fashion innovative uh, web3 companies i don't know if you want to talk about that or any other example from your portfolio because you know bitcraft has an enormous portfolio for really cool projects but yeah it would be great to kind of hear one or two examples if you if you can yeah, I mean, we've we've obviously made a bunch of investments. Um, sort of every person might not be as close to each investment. So, you know, there's definitely people internally who are closer to certain investments, but similar to Avi, you know, we've got a variety of ways. We source investments from conferences uh, to just our general network. Thankfully, we're a specialized, focused venture, venture fund focused on gaming. So a lot of gaming founders naturally go towards us or reach out to us. So thankfully, we've got quite a bit more inbound than your typical generalist fund because there just is less competition. So that's definitely beneficial in terms of investments we've made on the crypto side. I think two of sort of our most successful ones to date would be one, Immutable X being a layer two focused specifically for games. So the idea with higher throughput essentially focused on just being able to handle nfts and really being able to handle all the transactions and throughput that a game would have so that investment's been quite successful unfortunately it was before my time so in terms of that process can't really comment on it but just from the the deals that i've done while i've been at bitcraft sort of the process like avi mentioned it's a lot of spent it's a lot of time spent with the founder so developing that relationship now that um we're transitioning out of the covid zoom world we're trying to do our best when it makes sense to go and actually meet the founder. Cause I think that obviously is a completely different experience than when you're meeting with them live. You know um, I think on zoom conversations, you're able to have a 30 minute set window. It's pretty easy to hide on zoom. Whereas you, when you're spending five, six hours going for lunch, hanging out with someone um, you sort of run out of things to talk about related to the company and you actually get to have those those moments where you're just speaking um, not related to their company. It doesn't feel like due diligence. It's just really getting to know them as people. And I think those for us are where we build the best relationships with founders, where you get the most meaningful insights, not what you can say on an hour or three hours of Zoom calls throughout a few weeks of due diligence, but how can how are you actually sort of... Um, you know, over a period of six hours when 
where you run out of questions to ask about the company. And that's been something we're trying to do a lot more internally now that um, the world is opening up. It's becoming a bit more standard, sort of how it used to work in venture capital, where you know, you're never going to sign a deal. You're never going to invest in a company without actually meeting the people behind it. Have you ever actually invested in a deal that you've never met? And that was sort of been the standard, especially um, over the past few years in the crypto space um, and just venture in general, general, right? Now we're trying to make a bigger effort where it makes sense to, I definitely think there's a lot of benefits of Zoom, right? It is costly to fly, um, you know, hotels, et cetera, to be able to meet someone. But I think when it makes sense, when we're close by, um, if we can make it happen at a conference, et cetera, it's always important. Thankfully, we're meeting most of our companies either prior at conferences or at events we host. So we do get a lot of interface with them. But we, we have done quite a few investments where we, we were unable to meet the, the team in person, but we've been able to build conviction and comfort through spending tons of time over Zoom with them, as well as references from other people. Great. Well, thank you, uh, Sean. Do you want to... Give us an example of one one startup that you invested and how how did the process go? Yeah, so I, I think I shared quite a bit with uh, what Jamie and Avi said in terms of like how we kind of look for deals. And uh, for me, since I joined back in November last year, there isn't too much disclosable deals that I could actually share right now. But our kind of past investments has always been followed by the same principle where we really trust the founders and believe that we could basically hold their hands for the next decade to come. Um, blockchain is a fast moving industry and you know the exit opportunity here is much faster than the traditional industry where you have to wait for like five to eight years before you gain any sort of potential liquidity. With tokens, you could easily gain those within half a year. But even that, even with that, we, we think that the Web3 world as it starts to onboard more and more users and become more and more mainstream, uh, it also needs to build really value-driven products. And that's always been kind of at our core of investments. And that kind of led us to invest in things such as X Infinity and Immutable X. Um, and in terms of sourcing deals um, specifically, uh, we as a generalist fund, we tend to get a bunch of different verticals coming in. So it, it, that could mean something could probably come from a pure biotech or like a even like a moving storage deal that doesn't seem like it's related to crypto. But one of the advantage of being a generalist fund is that you get to compare your Web3 founders with a lot of other founders. And I argue that the bar for Web3 founders needs to be even higher than the other sort of industries. Just because that Web3 is such a young and innovative industry, you need to kind of maneuver around with a lot of uncertainties. So then it really comes down to getting to know the founder and like Jamie has said, it's, it's pretty hard to kind of find out what a person is like through Zoom. So we also try to spend in-person time if possible. But also at the same time, it's, it's not a very scalable process for us to kind of spend hours with every single founder. So what we tend to do is we tend to have quite a few criteria that we tend to look for in founders. And for each verticals that we invest in, we have an internal investment memo that we kind of use as kind of a checklist to see if the team fits certain criteria, then we start to kind of chat to them. Um, and some, we, we, we try to be very proactive in terms of how we reach out to people. Therefore, we could we could try to get into earlier deals at pre-seed rounds and seed rounds uh, much more easier. Um, and that's kind of our approach. Yeah, it was really interesting to hear a, a slightly difference between, you know, investing in Web2 and Web3 founders. But I would love to actually dive deeper into that a bit later, because as a generalist fund, it's uh, it's quite exciting to hear the story. But before we get into that, let's maybe dive into a bit of a gaming subject, because I know that all of you are interested in, in investing in gaming startups uh, and it's fascinating how the whole consumer market is developing these days uh, that consumers are no longer actually settling for kind of like linear entertainment uh, they actually want to be creators kind of as well like you we can see a lot of that in uh, in in happening in in different companies that they are tackling that kind of need from consumers so i really i'm really fascinated to hear your opinion about it and in general uh, what are the things that are really making this on-chain gaming 
uh, exciting. Like why why do games have to be built with a blockchain element? Like why blockchain is is great for for games? Like would be great to hear your vision and general opinions. What what do you what do you think about it? For on chain gaming, I think it's a fascinating thing that we talk about right now. Like. Because the first iteration of on-chain games are not really on-chain games. They just have their assets on-chain. Essentially, ownership is is kind of the main perspective of what's on-chain. And I think those are for really good reasons. One of it is the infrastructure side, which we just don't have the kind of computational power to provide for fully on-chain gaming. And also, at the same time, it's arguable whether we need to have a fully on-chain game at the first place, because there are just many mechanics that you know, you probably don't need to spend gas on, you don't need to perform them on chain. And by nature, blockchain would never be as highly computational as, you know, the traditional sort of computational power we have today, because being distributed, being decentralized would mean you sacrifice at least some part of your scalability. Now, with that being said, we've seen a lot of interesting applications on blockchain by day to date. Uh, Say, for example, in DeFi, you see like Uniswap with AMMs, in NFT, you see a lot of different plays that you could have with NFTs. And the insurances are also one of the things that could be quite relevant to a lot of the games with gacha ecosystems. So gacha systems are like essentially you you draw and then you it's almost like gambling but for gaming in a sense. And with all these interesting Lego bricks in the ecosystem of blockchain, you could have a lot more interesting mechanisms by combining different decks around with your actual game. And also with fully on-chain gaming, you could rely on certain probabilistic calculations for for your game to run. And therefore, you make your game more unpredictable for your gamers and therefore it could become more fun for people. So I think on-chain gaming is definitely interesting. And fully on-chain gaming is one of the things that I personally get really excited about and want to explore what sort of genres we are going to be able to see in the next maybe one or two years. And uh, in terms of middleware developer tools, I think those are the things that at this point in time is, is urgently needed because it's not easy to develop fully on-chain gaming at this moment for a lot of the studios. But we're seeing quite a few players around the world who are doing that, including, say, uh, Lettuce, including Xerox Curio, including Playment, in, at the, actually based in the UK. And I believe that uh, Avi and, and Jamie has more sayings on those because I believe they invested in Playment. So I'll hand over to them for them to talk further on those. Yeah, happy to happy to follow up on those um, thoughts, Sean. Yeah, so I think gaming just more generally as a vertical industri- industry um, is super exciting. It's one of the fastest growing forms of entertainment. I think we've seen entertainment, just content generally compress over the past 25 odd years from movies to TV shows to YouTube videos to now we're at the stage where it's TikToks and it's five seconds. It's really tough to retain users our attention spans have basically gone from our attention pans are getting shorter and shorter so the only way to actually keep people engaged is to make them do things like every second consistently um, which is effectively what gaming is so i think from that perspective gaming as an industry is pretty exciting just naturally we've seen products are now in implementing a ton of gamification and uh, mechanics a lot of like product innovation we've seen actually has been in gaming for five to ten years on the free-to-play side Um, So I think that's something that's super exciting. I think games are going to continue to eat into products a lot more. On the crypto side, I think there's a few interesting applications for gaming. One just being the most obvious one being digital property rights. Um, The ability for people to own their own assets creates this, you know, incentive that all this money and all this time I'm spending in games might not be completely lost. So that potentially from a game developer's perspective might increase players' propensity to spend, desire to do things within games. I think having those assets now, you know, with a lot of the infrastructure now that's built on on Web3, um, such as marketplaces, et cetera, the fact that now there's an economic layer that exists sort of introduces new monetization opportunities. So for game developers, they no longer need to just monetize through potentially primary sales, in-app purchases, battle passes, et cetera. They can now monetize on economic velocity within games, which gets kind of exciting when you think about these big MMOs that have these huge GDPs that have never really been accounted for. And there's a lot of value flowing throughout the whole ecosystem, a bunch of different items, a bunch of different assets, like there's real value that people want um, and there's a real flow. And for game developers to be able to easily monetize that economic velocity and having the tools to sort of make that value real and actually have a a dollar value in a sense 
um, open up sort of the idea of these like digital nation states, which I think in the context of MMOs could pre present some interesting opportunities. Like I fully think we'll see in the next five to 10 years, a game which has a, you know, economy that does $15 billion in GDP and has, you know, this huge economy that's transacting and the developers, basically just the government uh, imposing a tax on that economy, et cetera. So that's one example um, where we think blockchain and games make sense. As I mentioned, just on the asset layer, I think it makes a lot of sense. I think sort of early, I think the jury's still out on this, whether it's definitive or not, but early sort of data we're seeing is that um, having NFTs versus traditional Web2 assets are is increasing, you know, revenue per users in games, increasing retention slightly. Um, so that's obviously exciting. So for games that might not have the economy that's as complex as these MMOs and these RPGs, like the more casual side, hyper casual mid core games, I think you're going to see like new monetization uh, mechanics. It's also completely changed the whole UA aspect of, of that as well. So we've seen stuff with Limit Break, like with these free to own NFTs, how they've sort of been able to bootstrap a community. And I think it just opens up. And then the other thing that game developers that were very excited about it is uh, when you look at game development over the past 10 years, it's gotten really optimized for if you're competing on AAA, you need a ton of money. You need to be able to have good IP, show good, strong metrics before you're going to get funded to build these things. On the free to play side, it's so optimized that, you know, there is a playbook. There's not a lot of design space for game developers. So a lot of game developers that we've been supporting that have moved into the space or like, this is a blue ocean. I can now try new game mechanics, new, you know, there's not really a playbook or a way to build things yet. So it's been really exciting to see game developers be able to operate with this level of freedom that I don't think they've had for say the past five or six years, given how optimized the space has been. Yeah, it's fascinating. What's so much happening in there in the gaming industry and blockchain, really exciting stuff. Avi, do you want to add anything? I, I don't, I think uh, Sean and Jamie, they, they touched on, uh, I, I would just echo and, and support everything they just said there. You know, at, at, a, at a really high level, my view and, and Delphi's view is, is that internet native value belongs on blockchains. Um, and gaming in and the creator economy and digital art are, are, are sort of ripe for this transition of value onto blockchains. And, and a gaming, I think, is the culture is just a little bit more apt to experimentation and so um I, and I think that's what we've seen over the last you know two three years and you know some things work some things don't and we're excited for, for you know new economic experimentations like free to own and and play fi to sort of play out over the next few years and um and also get some some games that are just fun um and and high quality well-polished professionally made games so yeah yeah, and so gaming industry is one of the biggest now sort of industries for innovation, really. Like it's uh, it's uh, so much going on there. And at New Forum, we we uh, in a podcast we have quite a lot of creators within fashion industry. So we also have a New Moon uh, accelerator that is supporting startups uh, in the fashion space, for example, uh, giving them a little bit support to move into the blockchain. But I would also like to hear your opinion because I know, like for me, I, I done a lot of uh, kind of research around fashion uh, innovation, and uh, uh, my work was always to do with that. And I know that fashion industry is uh, looking into gaming and would like to, you know, take more uh, part in uh, in the industry as a whole, like uh, if I can say so. And you know, there is a lot of uh, being done there for brands, uh, and they are trying to tackle for for this industry so i would love to hear your opinion um and if you heard any great use cases or examples uh within the intersection of gaming and fashion i guess in general uh maybe we go with sean again first sure i, I think there's two two parts of it but I, I think there's two two parts of it by the way i'm not a fashion expert and i uh, suck at you know my my own taste on my own clothes as well so Maybe what I say is just complete, you know, random stuff, but I'll try my best. So I think there are two sides of things where I'm seeing um, fashions come into play with gaming. The first one is the gamer identities. So right now you've got so many different sort of blockchain games around. Um, so essentially all of them are different metaverses. And then in each metaverse, you could create your own avatar. And with these avatars, you could try to represent yourself in different formats. And then with, you know, it was yourself looking different in different metaverse, you might feel different about yourself in different metaverses too. 
And then a lot of the people are trying to make different sort of, I guess, brands or IPs around how people should dress up or look in a certain way in certain places. Um, and I'm seeing quite a few designers move into the space from the traditional designer space to the metaverse space to design, you know, fashion clothing for the metaverses that could be quite a unique sort of community icon or like almost like a symbol for, for people as they move across different metaverse. And that could really help people to get a feeling of belongings if they recognize the fashion, recognize the brand. So that's one side of it, which is the gamer identity. And the other one is um, combining the AR with blockchain is quite interesting too. That's just like very, very new, but people are trying to explore different ways about how to go with XRs. You know, XR essentially is like AR, VR, and so on. So force combined, we call it XR. XRs with blockchains. Um, so take, for example, if you really like your character in one of the metaverses, would you then print these digital kind of um, fashion into something physical and then try to ship that and then kind of have that as kind of your only exclusive ownings because nobody else could own it because you own that NFT that nobody else owns. Things like these people are kind of exploring around. So I think that quite fits with kind of the entire fashion industry and you could kind of essentially use your phone and use a bunch of smart devices to scan your digital character in the universe and then you could see those in with your bare eyes or with VR glasses through your phone and, and it shows you something I think it's quite fashionable again like I don't really understand fashion that much um, but these are two, two of the sites which I'm seeing fashion come into play with gaming mostly around the social layers of gaming yeah, I think I think fashion it's like a natural fit with games. We've seen Fortnite a lot. Uh, you know, I think the the one thing humans always want to do is um whether it be status or self-expression, they want to be able to express themselves, show off their tastes, whether it be their expensive clothing tastes, the fact that they can afford expensive clothes in the real world and I think that's going to you know transition over to the digital world. We've already seen it with sort of the NFT craze and all the punks and apes and how that whole status element played into how people were perceived. So I think there's a natural fit within gaming in general in these digital worlds. I think the where blockchain comes in is you get a bit more of the ability to actually enforce stuff like scarcity, which in the case of some clothing brands like Supreme is and you know some of the other high fashion brands is sort of one of the biggest reasons why they are worth so much is because they don't make a lot of supply. And I think, you know, traditionally it's been quite easy in the digital world to duplicate things but with nfts and stuff you're able to actually enforce that economic primitive which makes ability to have you know limited edition drops limited edition collections that have value and i think you know in the context of restless there's also this ability to be able to have fans and communities contribute to make to make fashion pieces with creators and then be able to share in that economic upside really easily just through the way you can fractionalize and write smart contracts to be able to be like, I contributed to this piece of clothing, which has gone on and done $10 million in sales. I get, you know, my reward very easily versus if you tried to do that sort of um, in the regular world, you know, you'd run into a ton of issues with banks, legal contracts, et cetera. And it's a lot easier to just do it in that, in that form. Yeah, obviously quite a lot of on the NFT side and like digital assets and uh, digital creations in terms of items, right? Like people, designers try to sell their their physical in the form of digital, I guess this is interesting for sure. Avi, what's, what is actually the most exciting for you these days? Like I know there is a fund that, you, you know, the thesis that fund is focusing on, but I want to hear personally from you like uh, what did you see in the market these days like wh where is the market going and what are the in terms of innovative kind of products or solutions that really excite you I don't have high conviction that this is a great market to be investing into but the world of, of public goods is is interesting to me um, and it's particularly interesting in the context of AI so I, I think you know everyone, and their mother has heard, you know, ChatGPT. Hopefully, has used it and watched the the media frenzy and and private market mania that, that's ensued over the last, you know, eight eight to nine months. But I think one thing that's given me a, a lot of or sparked a lot of curiosity in me is is the sort of ideological overlap between the AI communities and crypto. 
in the sense that like this is a, there's a very high correlation in the things that builders specifically are, are looking to sort of create and, and bring to fruition um, through technology. Um, and so this tells me that eventually there's going to be products and businesses that sort of emerge out of this overlap in sort of ideological thinking and, and communities. And I think further, like a lot of crypto's su success or many of crypto project success is, is due to an economic alignment between you know, different participants in these economies. And I'm sure we, we've all heard, you know, AI faces you know, major, major challenges with alignment. How do you align you know, these, these agents, especially as they become a bit more multifaceted in their, their abilities to align with you know, human interests? And I think this is like an area that I encourage the AI alignment crowd and the open source crowd and the AI safety crowd just to start experimenting a bit more. Um, kind of coming back to what I had mentioned on, on gaming, blockchains really do offer a, a surface, a sandbox of sorts for economic experimentation. And uh, this is obviously not like financial advice and uh, crypto has been littered with zealots and scams and sort of really irresponsible economic experimentation in the past, but it is this new white surface, um, especially for digitally native, internet native technologies. Um, and, and to me, AI is, is, is right there on the cusp waiting to be experimented with. So that's, that's an area that's interesting to me. Yeah, obviously, it's like everyone is talking about it right now. It's such a hot subject and uh, everyone is wondering how is it going to change all the industries, right? So yeah, I totally agree. It's super exciting. Sean, do you want to do you want to share your uh, your vision? Like what is exciting for you these days? And uh, would be great to hear your opinion. Yeah, sure, of course. And I share a lot with what Avi said. And, you know, I, me and Avi from time to time discuss about AI stuff as well. He's recently been writing really good stuff on AI. So um, guys, you should check it out if you haven't yet on his mirror page. But AI is, is definitely one of the things that's interesting. Let's just take fully on-chain gaming, for example. One of the things that we used to see was games that require PvP interaction, that's player versus player interactions, is the fact that sometimes you lack player liquidity. That means, say for example, if you need 10 people to play a game together, and at a certain point in the day, you need to wait, say, five minutes to start a match. And for some gamers, this is just bad gaming experience because they need to wait for so long for them to start a match. So traditionally, what gamers, uh, what these gaming studios do is they create certain bots. And these bots, they essentially play as players to join these PvP matches to play with the actual players. But then some of these bots have like malicious behavior. Some of them have glitches and... Traditionally, with these bots, you never let them to own any sort of actual resources in game because that just doesn't make sense because that means you essentially owning resources that belongs to the studio as the studio owns all of the bots. But with fully on-chain gaming, what we're seeing is there's a game called the Lithium, say, for example. They're creating what's called AI meta beings, and these things could essentially behave exactly like a real player to join their matches, to own different resources, to own NFTs and so on and so forth. And then essentially, they also have the uh, what's called characteristics, essentially like a personality sort of thing to interact with players to boost the entire uh, gamer economy. And then we could also see a lot of different multiverses branching from this. So essentially, you've got different versions of the same game that people could choose to join based on what they prefer. So fully on-chain gaming has quite a lot of different areas that we could look at and the two things I've mentioned are just some of it. One is to solve the player liquidity, the other is to create more diversities in terms of how you want to play this game. The other one that I'm really interested in recently has been the social infrastructure of games. So if you look around for most games right now, even in the traditional gaming world, there's maybe one or two really effective communicating tools. And for me, that was Discord. So I connect all of my friends on Discord and I essentially have a separate app open when I'm playing different games. But your kind of social graph in different games really doesn't go along as you move from one game to another. So I used to play League of Legends a lot and then I moved to CSGO, I moved to Valorant. And then like my friends there are slightly different because you know those are just different games by... Well, Valorant and League of Legends are by the same publisher, but CSGO is by different publishers. So I essentially need to make the connections all over again. But having that social infrastructure in Web3, which you could essentially move your social graph around, 
it's going to be super fun because essentially you could channel players from one game to another and then to another and then circulate those kind of players around economies, around different gaming experiences. So social infrastructure could be one of the things that I, I personally get very excited about. And there are quite a few companies trying to attack from different angles. Some of them are attacking from the WhatsApp angle, me directly messaging you, or some attacking from the Discord kind of angle where you go from one message to multiple recipients, or you go from a multiple to multiple kind of angle, community angle. Um, and I personally think that the first one, WhatsApp angle is the best one because it could kind of branch into the later two angles, but we'll see how that goes. And it's super early, so nothing set in stone and no clear winners out there yet. But exactly that's why I think it's interesting. Yeah, well, I find social platforms uh, quite interesting as well. And uh, no offense about Discord, I mean, but I think Discord needs to be way way improved in order so so everyone can use it i think it's too much focused on gaming and uh in order to make it you know more accessible for other industries i think uh, it could be interesting if somebody could create a better social media but it's just my opinion and i know that bitcraft you guys invested in discord but yeah jamie i would love to hear your uh view like what do you see exciting in the industry yeah, I mean, I think I think Sean and Avi touched on a lot of the points, um, so I won't I won't double double click on them too much. But I think the biggest thing, as Avi mentioned, is this ability to align incentives, um, sort of play with new economic uh, ways to align people economically in the context of gaming, particularly these MMOs, potentially new ways to build economies and bootstrap products as well. I think it's super interesting this whole aspect of tokenization, being able to reward users of the product for their use of the product and slowly build up effectively your cap table of a network or the ownership of these networks, platforms, products, features being sort of the people who are the biggest users, the most aligned with the network. The, and then you sort of get into these flywheels of sort of what we saw with Axie Infinity, where all the users became owners, became evangelists, and then became marketers and basically you know you get these like super big growing networks and i think what we've seen is um sort of in over the last cycle we've seen products i guess not really reach the bar on product side to be able to reach that point where users are no longer joining the network for um the promise of financial gain or some economic gain but they're using it because it's an actually really good product that has liquidity that was seeded by sort of these early users and i think sort of that's what I'm excited for over the next, I guess, two to four years, there's been a lot of funding that's poured into the space on the gaming side, at least, which I've got a lot more um, insights to can definitely attest to there's going to be some like stronger games, a lot better products are going to come in the next two to four years. I imagine um, where Avi spends his time as well, he's going to see a ton of really strong products come to market where, you know, potentially we're going to be able to merge with if the last cycle was really the way to summarize the last cycle was interesting incentive systems with poor products. Hopefully the next cycle, we're going to see, you know, these really potentially effective incentive systems, ways to bootstrap networks, bootstrap liquidity with products that are able to actually sustain user bases and be able to drive more organic growth that's less financial, like driven for the, you know, promise of financial gain. And I think um, if we're able to do that, that's really what's going to, you know, open the floodgates for Web3 and um, open the doors for some really interesting experimentation and hopefully innovation on how we align incentives, how we create incentives and how we, you know, create these these digital economies, which then we might be able to learn some stuff, which we'll be able to use in our real economies. So, yeah. So I, I'm going to dive into last question because you have so much experience with founders and because we are currently in the bear market, like it's really difficult for founders to, to I guess, find investment and uh, fundraise these days. I don't know what you would say, like, do your funds are still investing and you know, what would you give as an advice for founders where to find investors or in general advice, I guess, like how to become successful if, if you want to. So uh, Avi, do you want to go? I think we're, we're all pretty, pretty young here on, on this podcast. I mean, for me, I don't check LinkedIn. I don't check LinkedIn maybe once a month. Like, I, and I think that goes, I'd feel comfortable saying that most crypto investors don't live on LinkedIn and uh, they probably live on Twitter, Telegram, Discord. And so I think you just have to meet investors where they are. And there's a, 
you know, a, a changing investor base that's a lot younger. There's there's maybe a, a, a bit less of an emphasis on the professional, hey, dear investor name, you know, I would love for you to look at my company, blah, blah, blah. And, and I think there's a little bit more of um, an opportunity to be just more personable in in reaching out. And so I always respond to to founders that reach out on Twitter. If somehow they, they get to me on Telegram, um, I'll usually question how they got my Telegram and then I'll and then we'll, we'll have a good conversation. Um, but I think, you know, me, me investors were with where they're at. And then the other thing is just especially during this period where it's hard to invest, just to keep, keep hacking away. I think this is like a really great time. Again, coming back to the experimentation. Yeah, just just hack away, build cool things, even if they may not you know, drive, uh, especially for early stage projects, build cool things that may not be driving bottom line um, numbers for your business, but really demonstrate that you're like, you know, trying and, and pushing different avenues of whatever technology you're trying to, to bring to the world. So yeah, those are the two pieces of advice I'd have. That's, that's a great advice. Thank you. Jamie, do you want to also share? Yeah, sure. And we'll preface um, everything I say here with similar comments to Abby, that we are young for all of us. We've only been sort of in this professional investing side for you know a year, two years. This is the first downturn we've seen. Um, but what I can say is definitely... There's still a lot of capital out there. You know, I think there's a record amount of dry powder, especially on the venture side. So it's not like there isn't money to be um, deployed and we're still actively investing. I think backed and Delphi are also actively investing. I think what's changed is, you know, people are a lot more conscientious of where they're allocating capital. Capital is probably going to companies where they're proving stronger metrics. The founders have, you know, founded a company before, exited a company. There's a lot less. So the, the, the quality bars definitely gone up, which, you know, I think is a good thing. I think the best companies, uh, you can see sort of every big downturn um, is when the best companies are born because you actually have to show that you're making money in a tougher market. You're able to produce traction in a tougher market. So I think um, advice for founders would be, Probably now is maybe not the time to be pushing for aggressive growth strategies. I think it definitely it's a time for survival and being able to, like Avi said, build products, build product market fit, because investors now are going to want traction, early revenues. It's not so much to, you know, you're not going to get funded on an idea anymore. You're going to have to show a lot more traction. So in that case, you know, a lot of people who are pushing for growth and trying to pay their way for early traction now you know, you're going to have to extend those timelines. Um, and then in terms of reaching out to investors, uh, I check links at LinkedIn once a week. Personally, it's a bit of a war zone, uh, as I imagine Avi and Sean's LinkedIn are as well. But I do try and make an effort to go through and check everyone. But if any founders are building in the gaming and entertainment space, they can always reach out to Jamie at bitcraft.vc. I try and clear my inbox daily. So can promise um, we'll definitely take a look if... Uh, if people reach out there. That's a really good point. So Sean, do you want to share your advice for our entrepreneurs? Yeah, I share everything with what Jamie and Avi said, and they basically touched on the majority of the points that I wanted to share too. But I guess just to add on to that, because um, I used to be a, in the operator role as well, uh, running my own startup and kind of trying to, I, I at some point I was trying to raise for my hedge fund, raise for my startup as well. Uh, and now I'm sitting across the table being the one who actually listens to these pitches. One thing I came to realize was that sometimes, well, a lot of the times VC tend to look at the long-term you know, vision of founders. And sometimes it's really important to think about like what you want in three years time, five years time. And it's okay to be like five years time. This is, you know, a lot of uncertainties, things will be moving quickly. So what I can say is that for the next year, this is going to be my goal and this is how I'm going to test it, iterate it and break it. The idea is to kind of test and kill ideas that don't work out and be resilient in this market. And I personally think that a lot of the founders should pay more attention to their runways because although now we haven't like a market bounce back, but I don't know how sustainable this would be. And for a lot of the teams with less than 18 months of runway, they should consider how to better manage their budget, especially after a really successful bull run in the last few years. Some teams have hired a lot of people, which is great, but how do we 
best push the resources towards the product that could raise rich product market fit. One problem could be on the BD side, how could we do BDs better? And the other one in terms of tech and engineering, that's more of a, I guess, a better utilization and parallelization of essentially how do you parallel these tasks for them to be solved um, in the maximum efficiency manner. And I guess the last one is, if you are ever trying to reach a VC, don't be afraid to reach, you know, like VCs outside of the region. That's that's one thing that I started to kind of realize more and more. Because when I raised my first kind of um, fund back then, I was only reaching out to the people in China, maybe some other places near countries nearby. But again, if you have a global reach, that'll be much more useful for you in terms of how fast you could reach raise these rounds. Um, and, and have a global vision, but be regionalized. And what I mean by that is think about like how you can serve a product in five years to the entire world, because Web3 is very global, but you got to start somewhere. You need to find your niche market. You need to find your targeted verticalized group of users who would stick around for your product for the next three years, and then you scale up from there. So I guess those are kind of my, my tips for, for founders. That's amazing tips. Thank you so much, Sean, Avi, and Jamie. Thank you for your time, for joining our uh, forum today. And it's uh, it's great to have you on the podcast. And we really appreciate that you shared your views and opinions. It's uh, It's been really a great discussion. Thank you so much. And uh, I'd like to say also thank you for listening. And if you want to get more involved in our community, we'd be thrilled to hear from you. You can engage with us on our Twitter. You can also join our Discord to connect with our guests. And um, uh, there is also more information about us on our new forum website and new foundation website. So yeah, just uh, hopefully I can hear from all of you guys. So thank you guys again. And uh, thank you for your time. Um, thanks, for, thanks for having us. Yeah. That was fun. Thanks. Thank you.